Welcome to the River Mobile. This is our watershed, the Great Miami Watershed. A watershed is an area of land or community where everyone and everything in it shares the same water source. Here at Dayton, we live in the Great Miami River watershed, which covers 15 different counties and has a population of 1.5 million people. Our watershed has five major waterways that come together in Dayton. These are the Twin Creek, the Wolf Creek, Mad River, and of course, the Great Miami River. We can think of a watershed like a bathtub. Imagine that the bathtub is the watershed and the drain is the river. Any water that falls inside the tub will eventually go down the drain, carrying the dirt and the soap with it. Just like the rain that falls in the watershed will eventually flow through the river, the high sides of the bathtub are like the mountains and the hills that separate us from other bathtubs or other watersheds. This keeps the bath water or rain water from ending up in the neighboring watershed or on the bathroom floor. Now let's talk about downstream and upstream neighbors. As we can see, all rivers are connected. Upstream neighbors are those in the opposite direction of where the river flows. In this map, our river is flowing south. So the upstream neighbors are to the north of us, but this isn't always the case. Downstream neighbors are those past us moving in the direction of the flow of the river. So if I'm in Dayton, my upstream neighbors are Tip City, Riverside, Troy, and Piccawa. Question, if I'm in Dayton, who are my downstream neighbors? Answer, Moraine, West Carrollton, Miamisburg, Franklin, Middletown, and Hamilton. This is why it's very important we treat our rivers right because what we do affects our downstream neighbors. You'll learn more about this in the next River Mobile video. Welcome back. This is a map of the United States and shows how watersheds across our country are all connected. How we treat our rivers here in Dayton affects all the watersheds and river communities downstream from us. For example, we can see that the Great Miami River flows into the Ohio River, then the Mississippi River, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, which connects to the Atlantic Ocean. All of our downstream neighbors are affected by what we put in our section of the river. Likewise, all of our upstream neighbors affect the health of our river and community here in Dayton. So let's say we're having a picnic by the river and litter a plastic bag. With wind and rainfall, the plastic bag will reach the Great Miami River and can go to our downstream neighbors, maybe even all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. This is why it's super important to be mindful of what you and your community allows to enter our river and waterways. And remember to never litter. Even things we don't think could pollute our rivers can have a negative effect. For example, when we fertilize our lawns or crops, excess fertilizer washes away into our rivers when it rains. This can cause algal blooms downstream. An algal bloom is an area with large amounts of algae that take away oxygen that the fish need to live. So even too much of a good thing like fertilizer can cause harm to our downstream waterways. This is a no dumping sign. You may see one on the sidewalk or on a storm drain. Wherever you see this icon, it means anything that enters here ends up in our river. So if you leave your soda can outside and the rain takes it to the nearest drain, the can will end up in the river and can be carried through all those waterways we just talked about. Ohio River, Mississippi River, even the Gulf of Mexico. What are some ways we can have a harmful or negative impact on our downstream neighbors? And what are some ways we can have a positive impact on our downstream neighbors? Hint, there are more examples than the ones I mentioned in this video. Answers could include littering, car leaks, using too much fertilizer, car wash soap. Can you come up with any more? Welcome back to the Rivermobile and to the history of our rivers. First, I want to ask you to begin thinking about this question as you continue your Rivermobile experience. Who protects our rivers? Spanning glacier to modern time, it all began a long, long time ago when glaciers were here and carved out the river valley we live in today. 
This area used to be filled with large valleys formed by rivers over two million years ago. These valleys were then buried by glaciers, or huge ice sheets, throughout history. The glaciers continued to carve out these valleys as they moved through the regions. When the glaciers melted, sand and gravel from the glaciers filled these buried valleys. Then, as rain fell, the valleys containing sand, soil, and gravel filled with water and eventually formed our aquifer, the Great Miami Buried Valley Aquifer. An aquifer is an underground layer or body of porous rock, sand, or gravel that is filled with water. Today, rain continues to recharge or fill the aquifer beneath our feet. We'll learn more about the importance of our aquifer in the next video. But first, let's continue with our history. The glaciers left behind a fertile river valley and floodplain that made it attractive to people to live. The first people to live along our rivers were the Fort Ancient Sun Watch Indians. Archaeologists are not sure why the Fort Ancient Sun Watch Indians disappeared or left the area. The next inhabitants were known to be the Shawnee, and eventually English and French settlers came to the area, all of whom came to the area because our rivers and river valley. Why do you think people wanted to live and settle near rivers? Well, there are also downsides to living along fertile rivers, river valleys, and floodplains. A very important part of our watersheds and Dayton's history is the Great Flood of 1913. At the time, it was the greatest natural disaster Ohio had ever experienced. The floods reached the attics of some people's homes, and about 300 people died. This is why the city of Dayton, led by Colonel Edward Deeds, worked hard to ensure such a disaster would never happen again. One of the ways the city made sure such destruction wouldn't occur again was by installing a series of earthen levee walls and five dry dams around the city of Dayton. These were the first of their kind, designed by Arthur Morgan in 1920, and they are still working to this day. You may recognize these dams because four of them are also metro parks. Inglewood, Lockington, Taylorsville, Huffman, and Germantown. These dry dams are built like a wall across the river with openings that allow a normal amount of water to flow through, so fish and aquatic animals aren't disturbed. When it rains, the river's water flow exceeds the normal amount. The extra water is retained and stored around the dams in floodplains such as farmlands and parks. This prevents water from flooding downstream into our cities. Still today, this world-renowned flood protection system keeps Dayton and our neighboring watershed communities safe from flooding. In the next classroom, you will learn more about our aquifer, how it connects to our rivers, and how it provides drinking water to homes, schools, and businesses in our community. These dams can withstand even more water than what flooded Dayton in 1913. In other areas, like Cairo, Illinois, water levels exceed flood protection systems, causing developed land to be at risk of flooding. In Dayton, our dry dams act as a natural floodplain, retaining water in undeveloped land and parks. Presenting Colonel Edward Deeds and Arthur Morgan, world-renowned innovators and community leaders in Dayton, Ohio. Hello, Morgan. Care to assist me with a presentation about Dayton's flood control system? Of course, Deeds. My favorite topic, as you know. Why don't you go first? Very well, then. Let me first introduce myself. I am Colonel Edward Deeds, and after the flood of 1913, I wanted to make sure that our community would never experience such a disaster again. That's right. In fact, at the time, no one believed that your plan of comprehensive flood protection was possible. So my good friend Deeds went out into the community, educating people that if this wasn't done right, and in a big way, their homes in our city would eventually be underwater again. Well, thanks for the compliments, Morgan. You're quite the leader yourself, you know. And my pal, Arthur Morgan, is a self-trained engineer who designed and built the integrated system of dry dams, riverbanks, and levees that protect the city of Dayton from flooding every time our region experiences heavy rainfall. Morgan, tell us about the system you spent so much time researching and designing. With pleasure. 
The dams I designed were the first of their kind. The dry dams in Dayton are basically concrete walls built across the river, with openings in them that allow a normal amount of water to flow through. When the river's water flow exceeds the normal amount, the extra water is retained and stored around the dams on farmland and in park districts. Well stated, Morgan. So the park systems in our area are not only there for people to enjoy, but also act as floodplains during heavy rain, which prevents our cities from flooding. In fact, four of our five dams have metro parks surrounding them. Let's see, there's Germantown, Inglewood, Huffman, Taylorsville Metro Park, and uh, uh, what was the other? Oh, that would be Lockington Dam in Shelby County. Ah, yes. And thanks to the many great leaders in this community, Dayton and the surrounding region will never experience a major flood again. Precisely. So, off with you now to explore the rest of the Rivermobile. Morgan and I will see you again soon to discuss more about Dayton's amazing water systems. Welcome back to the Rivermobile. I hope you are ready to learn more about our Buried Valley Aquifer and water system. Here, we can see the city of Dayton and the Great Miami River that flows through it. This huge area beneath it is our aquifer. As you can see, in our region, the rivers, or surface water, and aquifers, or groundwater, are often connected. Remember that an aquifer is an underground layer of soil, sand, and gravel that is saturated with water. We can think of our aquifer like a sponge because it is porous and holds water. The sand and gravel in our aquifer makes it special because it allows water to seep through and fill or recharge our aquifer every time it rains. And as the water seeps through the underground layers of sand, gravel, and soil, a natural filtering process occurs. But how do we access this drinking water if our aquifer is underground? First, wells, like these, are used to pump water from the aquifer. Though this water has been naturally filtered by our aquifer, it goes through additional filtration and cleaning. So, the wells pump water from the aquifer and into pipes that lead to the drinking water treatment plant, where it is tested and further treated to assure it is safe for the community. Then, this water is sent to homes and businesses for daily use through more pipes. This is the water you hopefully brushed your teeth with this morning. Can you tell me how many other ways you used water today? But what happens to all the water you send down your drain? Like when you spit in the sink after brushing your teeth or after you flush the toilet? That water is sent through a different set of pipes to a different treatment plant called the wastewater treatment plant or the water reclamation plant. Here, the waste is sifted through and the water is cleaned through several processes. This clean, treated water is sent back to the Great Miami River, and some seeps back into our aquifer, creating our very own Dayton water cycle. You may be wondering, if we're taking all this water from the aquifer, won't it dry out? The good news is that the aquifer gets refilled every time it rains but it is still important to conserve water because both treatment processes require lots of energy. How far did you have to walk this morning to get to water? In other areas where water is not easily accessible, people are forced to travel long distances to collect water. In Dayton, due to our abundant water supply, it can be pumped from the aquifer and treated for use in our communities. We are very lucky to have so much clean water available, and it is our responsibility to preserve and protect it. Our watershed has a lot of natural wildlife, including things like birds, like the great blue herons or the kingfisher, and other animals like deer, fish, turtles, beavers, freshwater mussels, and even plants like rose mallows, cardinal flowers, and so much more. Recently, even bald eagles have returned to our watershed and can be seen flying over the river. So why do you think bald eagles have come back to live around our rivers? Well, you see, they eat our fish. 
Yes, our rivers have so many fish that the bald eagles can rely on for their food. And our rivers are clean and healthy enough to supply food to the fish and other species that rely on one another in the food chain. Have you ever played in a stream, river, or creek and looked for critters? Well, some of the living organisms in our rivers that you may find are called macroinvertebrates, or baby insects. They are great food for fish and birds, and most of them can only live in clean water. So, if you find a water penny, damselfly, crawdad, or other types of macroinvertebrates, you know the water is clean and the river is healthy. All of us can be naturalists and citizen scientists. So the next time you're near the river, be safe and carefully pick up a rock or two. See how many different types of macroinvertebrates you can find. You see, our river's ecosystem has a lot of native species which are important for biodiversity. However, we also have invasive wildlife. These plants and animals may look like they belong, but they are actually non-native to this area and they can also harm the environment by taking over and not letting other species and especially native species to survive. Some invasive species to look out for are zebra mussels, Asian carp, and curly leaf pondweed. As we just learned, our rivers and creeks are both healthy and clean, which makes them a great source of recreation. For example, three of our rivers are national park water trails, including the Mad River, the Stillwater River, and the Great Miami River. So you can actually kayak or canoe on these rivers, but always make sure to wear a life vest. You can also bike along the river. There are over 300 miles of connected paved bike trails to discover in our watershed. Additionally, there are over 35 species of fish to discover in the Great Miami alone, including smallmouth bass. In other areas, rowing and power boats use the increased water depth created by low dams to recreate along the river. However, in Dayton, along stretches of the river, low dams are actually dangerous hazards for boaters or spectators who can get trapped in the dam's currents. So what are some things that you do or want to do for fun on or near the river? I personally like to go fishing, kayaking, and canoeing, and I even like to go biking along the river. Just remember to always be safe and prepared. Well friends, now that we've learned more about our watershed, our aquifer, and our local rivers through the Rivermobile, who protects our river? It's you. Let's make sure we do our part to be good river stewards and work to protect and preserve our rivers for so many generations to come. We can do this by appropriately throwing away our trash and recyclables, spreading the word to others about the importance of our river and aquifer, and by getting out and having fun in nature enjoying our rivers. Congratulations, now you too are a river steward of the Great Miami River Watershed.